Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us on what I think is a very exciting panel. It is a protecting sports in regions of turmoil. Now we're joined by career diplomats, uh, three men with extensive experience in negotiating, in moderating uh, what are very difficult situations. So first of all, we have uh, Mr. Miguel Moratino, he's the high representative of the UN Alliance of Civilizations, joining us from New York. We have uh, Stefan de Mistura, again, career diplomat, former Under Secretary General and UN Special Envoy to countries like Syria, Iraq, uh, and Afghanistan. And last but not least, we have Mr. Konstantinos Filis, who is the Director General of the International Olympic Truce Center. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you much for your time. If I could start briefly, uh, starting with you, Mr. Moratinos, uh, explaining a little bit about um, what your work is within the Alliance uh, and how the tools you have, how you try to implement them on the ground for change. Well, thank you. Let me first, Stephanie, to thank you and to, to thank the International Center for Sports and Security and also our dear partner, UNOCT and UNICRE, for uh, having this, um, this initiative, to have this uh, conversation, as you say, in order that we can go a little more deeper and how we can really achieve our goal, that is to, to have a world where terrorists, fanatic, uh, you know, inverted commas, barbarian, will not have a place uh, to live with us and we will have a succeed in our uh, common endeavor. So the United Nations allows civilization. Uh, I look back of how it was created. It was, uh, I, I would say, my idea, my concept. It was uh, specifically after the uh, terrorist attack in Madrid on the 11th of March of 2004. So it was a response to a kind of uh, terrorist attack but at the same time, after being convinced ourselves in Spain that there was a negative tendency to put together and engage each other, this uh, so-called West and this is called Islamic and Arab world, in order in a collusion course. It was the, the response of what uh, Summer Huntington tried to demonstrate, uh, that it's a class of civilization, and we were on the contrary, convinced that it is a class of ignorances, but not a class of civilization. So this UNOSC from his inception is uh, have a uh, anti-terrorist goal, uh, how we can de-radicalize, how we can create uh, an understanding and mutual respect between different cultures, religious and cultures and civilization. And so um, what we have been doing during the last 15 years was mainly on the um, prevention side. You know? We were, my predecessor created several programs on education, on media, on immigration, on youth. And then I include as uh, Stefan de Mistura, my dear friend was referring now in the Afghan talks how the women can play even an important role. So I include since my appointment, the um, gender issue as one of the pillar of this mediation uh, capacity. We were not in the, in the, we were in the prevention, we were not in the mediation as uh, the Mistura was uh, trying to make peace in Afghanistan, in Syria, no, and Libya. so, uh, but the, the UNOSC have the capacity to work, I think now, in both cases, I think on the prevention to create a better society through their programs. And at the same time, uh, we are now exploring and we have a good cooperation with DPPA and the UN system, the mediation uh, responsibility uh, body in order that we can help facilitate a positive outcome. Uh, listening to the Mistura say, what is the Taliban now negotiating with the government and the United States government, the United States government at the beginning of when they were trying to start a negotiation in Doha, they were uh, asking ourselves to be prepared in case uh, the deal is done and they are starting to have a plan of action, there will be a, for them and I think for us, a place for the Alliance of Civilization. I think uh, who better than ourselves could understand the difficulties to put together some uh, 
were uh, positioned from the Islamic point of view, from the secular point of view, from the role of women, for the role of youth. So I think there is a, a, a possibility that the United Nations Alliance of Civilization can be, uh, I think, a very good instrument for this uh, conflict zone. The same has happened now after Nagorno-Karabakh uh, situation in crisis. The Minister of Culture of Azerbaijan has called us and have demanded us to be ready uh, to participate and the rebuilding the trust between the communities. And I think that is something that will provide to generation uh, the possibility to understand better the other. If we okay. don't respect the other, if we don't really have uh, this understanding, it's going to be very difficult to have a uh, uh, living together among ourselves. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, engaging people, and I think sport is so important when it comes to that. Also having opposing sides, often you put them in a football game or whatever, all of a sudden there's a communal language. Um, let me move on uh, to Mr. Phillies. When it comes to the Olympic truce, um, this goes back over 2000 years. Explain to us a little bit about how you are trying to implement it now and what does it mean? Great. Uh, uh, thank you, Stephanie. Well, the International Olympic Truth Center is, um, is one of the main bodies of the Olympic movement that advocates all those uh, ideals that link the Olympic Games with society. And we aspire to create a conscience of nonviolence, uh, a mentality where people will not fight uh, other people. Uh, but we cannot just turn the dial to peace mode. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we do not bring peace, uh, but we can uh, cultivate the conditions for the ideals of peace to flourish. And we use uh, sport as an example, as a means and as an inspiration to achieve uh, our goals. And we have educational programs that we run um, throughout the world uh, in developed countries mainly, but we also work to heal wounds in post-conflict societies. And we offer uh, systematic training to those promoting uh, our ideals in recovering uh, societies. And as you know, and as of course the uh, two very experienced diplomats uh, know a lot better than I do, not all conflicts are the same. Uh, therefore, we have to go case by case and organize our efforts uh, accordingly. And under certain conditions, we can even work with peacekeeping missions to provide them with ways to engage uh, children in sports activities. Uh, we focus very much on, on the youth um, as a means to help uh, post-conflict societies uh, transcend their differences. And we strongly believe, uh, and I strongly believe personally, that no society is warlike by nature, but a society is subject to the choices made by its governing uh, uh, elites. Uh, so uh, to make a long story short, the IOTC, uh, IOTC in the National Liberty Center works at a socio-political level and develops initiatives that address the issues of respecting the Olympic truce and promoting its values in society so as to make them part of our uh, everyday life, but indeed, and I will close with that. And then we can come back with some of our initiatives, some of the projects that we run, which I hope are of interest to you and uh, uh, my co-panelists to pursue our goals effectively. We certainly need to develop the appropriate synergies and attract uh, the right partners. And this is uh, probably one of the reasons why I'm here. And I would like to thank my good friend uh, Massimiliano and of course, uh, all, uh, the whole organization, not only for the invitation, but for the very uh, fruitful uh, and precious partnership that uh, we have with uh, ICSS for the last uh, three, four years. For sure, I think uh, partners and donors are all key when it comes to rebuilding uh, challenging you know, infrastructure in countries uh, that have faced challenges, that have faced conflict, that are post-conflict. I want to bring in uh, Stefan Dimisura. You are uh, you know, a career diplomat. You have extensive experience in negotiation, in trying to moderate, in bringing two sides, three sides, ten sides to the table, and you know just how difficult that is. Now, listening to some of the infrastructure that I think is in place, and it sounds wonderful, but obviously also as a journalist, our question is always like, how does that translate down to change on the ground? And I wanted to ask you, looking at these you know, social, political uh, efforts, uh, when it comes to things like sport, which isn't always a priority when it comes to these countries, how difficult would you say it is to be able to affect real change when you have a country that is still experiencing uh, some form of unrest, turmoil, post-conflict situation? It is difficult, but um, I was planning in my original plans in my life to become a medical doctor. Then I 
my father convinced me to become a UN uh, international doctor of countries in difficulty. But basically, it's the same principle. But the idea on how to respond to this type of challenge, you said, is still helping me. I give an example. As you heard, I remember in 1996, we tried with UNICEF at that time after the 1993 General Assembly Revolution on Olympic Truth in Atlanta to have a Olympic Truth. And the dream was, it didn't work, but the dream was to have during the Olympic Games a ceasefire or a reduction of violence. Let's call it like this. Reduction of violence. During those days, and it did work in many countries, but not everywhere. So did we fail? No. Like a doctor, you try to save life. If you can't, you reduce the pain, but you try again. And that's what we just heard actually from there. So my feeling is that we are finding it difficult to actually use sport to stop the war, but we can make a big difference. Can I give you one or two examples, if I may? The you first one, you remember very well, I was just looking at it, 1971, the ping pong game between China and Russia and US. Did that not make a big difference? It did. It took some time, but it did. In 1995, we had Mandela with this wonderful initiative regarding rugby. In 2002, I myself had the honor to actually not being a good football player at all, and to play a football match in Rome, guess what? Between Israelis and Palestinians playing together. And Arafat was there and Shimon Peres was there. And we convinced the, the other team, which was the, a group of famous singers and artists in Italy, to actually play against Palestinians and Israelis so that they could, if they did, as they did, when they would actually clap their hands together and say, we can make it. It did work. It didn't work for a long time. We had a conflict starting afterwards. But when they won on that football match, Arafat and Perez looked at each other. I was there, I was playing, but I was looking as well. And they just clapped together. That type of initiative makes a difference. Does it change everything? No. But in the UN, we are used to see that we do steps in a direction, sometimes it takes a long time. And sport can make that difference. Mr. Felix, go ahead. I see you raising your pen. <laughs> well behaved. <laughs> uh, thanks for that. Um, I just wanted to add uh, uh, to uh, what uh, Mr. Temistura just said, that in 1994 was the first uh, major success with regard to, uh, uh, in the, uh, to Olympic truce when uh, during the Lillehammer Winter Games for 24 hours, we secured a ceasefire in the whole of ex-Yugoslavia, which of course might be regarded as a very small place in the world map, but still it was a major success. It was only for 24 hours during the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympic Games in Lillehammer, but still it was the first uh, uh, success uh, for uh, Olympic truce. And of course, uh, I can refer to that uh, afterwards, but another major success was during the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Games, when uh, we had uh, this uh, uh, tremendous and to an extent unexpected uh, uh, rapprochement, or at least uh, an attempt to find some common denominators between North and South Korea. And if it weren't for the games, of course, it is a matter of political uh, uh, determination. Uh, there's no question about that. And we should not mix sports with politics. But if it weren't the Olympic Games in Pyeongchang, I presume uh, that uh, probably we wouldn't have this window of opportunity uh, for uh, a, a kind of um, a rapprochement between North and South Korea uh, to, to take place. So just these two examples as uh, extra uh, cases of uh, success uh, for Olympic truce during the last uh, many decades. Of course, there are failures as well, I have to, I have to admit. Uh, let's look at, uh, for instance, and I will close with that, at what happened during the opening ceremony in the Beijing Games in China in 2010, in 2008, sorry, when we had this, uh, the outbreak of hostilities between Russia and Georgia, or even in 2012 during the uh, London Games when the Syrian conflict was, was raging. 
uh, but still we build on our successes and we learn the lessons from our failures. Uh, thank you. I want to move on. Mr. Moratinos, I saw you uh, raising your pen. I also wanted to actually, interestingly, uh, Mr. Dimistuda mentioned uh, Israel-Palestine. I know you for a while were the uh, EU special representative to the Middle East peace process. I mean, I remember once being at a Shabbat dinner in Jerusalem uh, with the father was very much uh, about, you know, uh, solving the crisis between the two sides. The mother wasn't. I remember the little boy sat next to me and said to me, well, I play football. Uh, with Palestinians. Uh, so he meant he almost felt like there was a kind of a connection. I wanted to ask you about the power of sports also after you make the point you wanted to make when you see a conflict like Israel-Palestine, for example, where people are often at so polar opposites because they don't know each other. What power can sport bring uh, when you have, like Mr. Dimasuda was mentioning, two sides all of a sudden playing together or even on the same team? Well, I raised the, the pen because I want to intervene because in my introductory remark, I didn't mention, mention the sport, but of course, sport is one of our main tools in today's work of the UNOSC. I mean, that's the reason we are here now, not because we are supporting your initiative. We know how important it is to mobilize the symbolism of sport in the philosophy, in the ethic, at the same time as a driver for youth in order to become much more integrated in their society. So I raise my, my pen because absolutely I agree with uh, Constantinos and uh, Stefan, a fantastic highlight that sport have uh, contribute to the effort of peace in the world. And I think uh, while the Chinese uh, during the state diplomacy, the football diplomacy, ping pong diplomacy, Olympic Games diplomacy was absolutely uh, astonishing and fantastic. But I want to, to share with you my conviction that even if it was fantastic at that time, uh, today sport is even more, more, more important than in the 60s, 70s, at the end of uh, the 90s. Today sport is uh, one of the, let's say, um, common denominator of all, not only state, not only member state, not only government, but the, the whole society. I mean, you can mobilize uh, with one idea through a sport, much better if I now try to explain myself, even being a, a politician, how I conceive the new future. I will not have, a, the audience will be 20 people, but if I bring with me eh, Messi, or we bring with me one of the big uh, stars in the sport, the room will be, will be totally full. So I want to tell you that what you have done in a sport has been fantastic, but now we have a, let's say, a, a much more strong factor, a much stronger instrument to mobilize uh, our ideas and our commitment. And you were referring to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Well, myself, I play football. I was a good football player, by the way. And so I played uh, oh. as Perez Center. And I, I was part of the Palestinian team and we defeated the Israeli one. So uh, I was exhausted, but I, I played not bad. And so uh, that that's can really uh, be an element to demonstrate that they can live together. But if you see, uh, in today's, uh, let's put football, it's the most, let's say, uh, common, uh, more attractive uh, sport today. Uh, well, any team, any uh, great of the Liga, of the British uh, Championship, French, Italy, uh, whoever, you look the, the the team, and these are multicultural team. There are people coming from Africa, from Latin America, from North Africa, from the Arab world, from uh, European, from, so they play together and they understand each other. And then at the end of the day, they are satisfied when they are winning or they are uh, together to try to, to respond to the challenge. So uh, the sport have now, let's say, even a stronger voice to really mobilize. That's the reason we are, as you know, I see mobilizing what we call the global the one humanity campaign that put all the football clubs together. And we are in close contact with the 
Qatar government in order that we can after the 2020, 2022 World Soccer game to have a, what we call a, um, one humanity cup that they will put youth people of different components from culture and religion to play together. And that is what we are working with the uh, International Spirit Group in meeting. I mean, uh, we had in, in, uh, in September and they have a fantastic um, debate and then they conclude that for youth engagement in sport in order to combat uh, the prevention of uh, uh, countering violent extremism, the young people are positive um, change. I mean, they are agents of positive change. And so I think we should try to enlarge our program, our project with youth because sport today is even much more um, capable to send a message. I, I will conclude with a just recent um, manifestation. Well, is uh, related to racism, eh? but uh, that uh, give us an element of thinking. Well, what happened in France recently, two football players to start, uh, Mbappe and Griezmann, uh, come publicly denouncing, let's say, the excessive um, use of force by the police. And President Macron and the government, they listen more to the opinion of these two football players that maybe to many organizations, they were much more, you know, impacted by the two great stars of football in France, they come in this uh, public statement. So Absolutely. the capacity they have is larger than it happened, let's say 10 years ago, 10 years ago. I think uh, absolutely that your point on uh, the power of sports stars giving a message and having people listen um, is, is, I think, is unchallenged. I think bringing it back to protecting sports in regions of turmoil, I think, you know, you can't do it alone, right? You need governments to play ball. You need the donors to play ball. You need the security situation uh, to play ball. I mean, we're looking at a... Uh, you know, allowing a grassroots level to happen where you have, even if you look, for example, at a refugee camp, just allowing the children uh, to play a game that's been organized, you know, by whatever NGO already helps morale of people who don't have much to do. And then if we take it right up to the level, to the institutional level of government, of policy, of rebuilding a broken infrastructure, um, of allowing, I know the Iraq team was training outside for years while the country was in conflict. Um, how, and I'm gonna throw this out to you, whoever wants to reply can do so. How seriously do governments these days consider sports in countries um, that are undergoing, you know, and let's face it, the, the turmoil that we see in many countries today are very much also a product of outside interference. So there's a lot of complications when it comes to the conflicts these days. So how seriously, I suppose my question is, is sports being taken and protecting it uh, in these areas? Whoever, who wants to go first? Mr. Dini Studa, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, the, not enough, frankly, because uh, I've been um, involved in uh, several conflicts recently in my last year. So, so let's just mention Afghanistan, Iraq and Syria. When the country is in the, in the government in charge of that country during that period is involved in the conflict, they are using sport mostly to keep unity of the position of the government. And that's not inclusive. And when it's not inclusive, that means it's not really helping. It is much more helping when there is a ceasefire and then there is a symbol of that unity trying to recompact by having a sport. Secondly, during conflict, young people are drafted or are fighting or are taking care of their families. And B, the sport events become a target because there are a lot of public in it and especially in civil conflicts. From that point of view, I must say there is homework to be done in the sense of not just hoping that governments will use sport during a conflict, but use it properly and not instrumentally. And I've certainly, I remember being in, in Iraq in 2007, I believe Iraq was in the final uh, and everything stopped. And when they won, uh, there was celebratory gunfire, but it just goes to show that 
everyone was watching all of a sudden the conflict stopped practically and I think we've seen it either in other conflicts. Um, moving on, uh, Mr. Felix, we were talking about the challenges of, of all these amazing intentions that, that everyone has, but actually implementing and seeing concrete changes on the ground. What would you say is your biggest achievement to date uh, that you feel, and I know this is challenging, but you feel is a concrete something that you saw and you said, wow, you know, uh, we managed to do this. If I may, I just wanted to add uh, to your uh, previous question, uh, one comment. Um, when we talk about sport uh, in a post-conflict uh, society, uh, of course it is, uh, you know, the, 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 the general uh, picture, but we can also bring it down to, to the community level. What do I mean by that? The, um, for instance, uh, uh, on the community level, uh, we can uh, introduce, uh, especially, of course, uh, to the youth, we can introduce rules uh, uh, to the game in order to uh, uh, make them realize that they need to respect the rules of the game, which by extension means that they should also uh, go in one way or the other to respect the rules of uh, uh, the state or of the community uh, or of how a society works, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, of course, we try to give them incentives. And I'm talking again for the community level to give them incentives to come to realize that uh, they can stand a defeat uh, uh, in a game, uh, but if, the, if, uh, if they uh, are uh, in a war, uh, defeat might mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, dead people, might mean death, might mean loss of life. And we also try to uh, 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 make them uh, understand that um, uh, they should seek a second chance in a given game, even if they lose, uh, in the war, uh, it doesn't go uh, 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 that way, uh, necessarily. Uh, so uh, gradually, uh, they learn uh, how to uh, use a ball uh, better than how they can use a weapon, because uh, the two diplomats and, of course, you uh, know that uh, in many places around the world, uh, we have uh, warriors uh, from a very uh, young age. So, uh, you know, we should give them uh, incentives. It's not always easy, but uh, uh, this is uh, the, the ultimate uh, uh, goal. Uh, so, about our achievements. Well, there have been some, but I will refer only to three uh, for the sake of time as well. Briefly, please. <laughs> yes, very briefly. Um, first is the Olympic Youth Sports Center, which was founded in Burundi. Uh, this is a multi-sport complex that is located on the border region with the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, an area known for tension and violence and sorely lacking in uh, recreational uh, infrastructures. We need to build on infrastructures. We need to invest on infrastructure. The second is the Sport for Hope program uh, through which we provide young people and communities with opportunities to practice sports and receive education on the values of Olympism. Uh, and uh, uh, it already runs in Rwanda, uh, Burundi, and Zambia. And the last one is a, a, a Tegla Rupe peace race, uh, which brings together wearing communities from the wider Horn of Africa. Uh, and such projects uh, serve as a unique platform for interaction between traditionally hostile communities. And under the theme, no to guns, yes to pens, the path to peace, uh, this race has attracted more than uh, 3,000 people from runners to artists and spectators as it used to uh, happen in the ancient years, in ancient Olympic Games, because back then athletes, spectators, but also artists were very, very uh, important uh, for the Games to take place. Uh, those are ex excellent examples. And I, I know how rare it is as well to get these things achieved and particularly the hope that it brings to the people on the ground, the youth on the ground, who often don't have any of the opportunities and the power that sports has. Um, security you were talking about. I wanna move, I, Mr. yes, I'm moving to Mr. Moratinos, I see you. Um, also, uh, please make your point, but I also wanted to ask you, I know that the UN Alliance also deals with the protection of religious sites. Uh, is there a way that you could apply that in terms of uh, you know, the sports area, securing, providing security, providing stability in countries that still face those challenges. 
Yes, uh, Stephanie, but before I answer you about uh, how we can benefit for our plan of safeguarding religious re site, let me add, uh, I think, a dimension of the comment of Stefan and, and Constantinos, you know, about uh, how a sport in conflict uh, areas can be um, positive for, of course, uh, re reconciling the society. And I fully agree. Number one, with Stefan de Mistura say, I mean, if you have a, um, a conflict and you want to use a sport, have to be as uh, once you have a unity in the country, you cannot have a sectarian use of this sport. But uh, that's number one. And then we, I think we all agree. And it had, it, I think it's a kind of precondition and we have to put in the report of today, I think it's one element that we have to be very clear. But the second one I want to add is that uh, sport has been, is still is an extremely useful instrument, instrument for uh, avoiding radicalization. So in a conflict area, where you have displaced people, you have refugees, you have uh, people that are uh, under, the shock of the bombing, shelling, etc., and they are um, in talks. They can go either to become radicals, or they can have other options. And I think we we have to really uh, give the, the the capacity to play a sport and to have you know uh, these uh, facilities, uh, these facilities. Uh, in order that we can really um, benefit, in order that they will not be radicalized. I think a, a sport should be an instrument in order, as we say, to really prevent violent extremism. So we have to provide these displaced people, these refugees, these uh, lost people with a football ground, with a basketball ground, etc. On the issue of the safeguarding religious side, I think uh, uh, it's religious site as in the global strategy of our friend uh, Voronkov, we are part of what we can call vulnerable sites. No, religious site is a site that attract enormous, enormously, you know, the terrorists because they have a, a multiplying factor impact, you know, I around the world. That, so uh, for that, I think we can have a holistic approach. We have a the preparedness and the response we are giving recommendation to the governments and to civil society through education, through meetings, through preparing themselves. So we can extract um, practically all the um, recommendations are included in the plan. That can I think we can support the facilities and how we create an environment of living yeah, together and playing together and having this sport as a catalyzer for all of them. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if someone has got some kind of audio playing in their background. Just check if you have anything that's playing because there seems to be some form of interference. Um, I just want to move on in terms of when you talk about these projects, which are incredible, but they take money. They take efforts to rebuild on the ground, logistical support. Is there enough donor support uh, to help rebuild as part of these uh, projects? Uh, Mr. Demistruda, let's start with you and then go to Mr. Felice as well. Um, is there enough support and money coming in to be able to execute all of this? Well, I will leave Constantino mostly to uh, refer to that, but uh, my impression is no, there is not. But let me add, I believe that if there is one area where uh, the money should not be too much of a difficulty, it should be sport. Because billions of people are following sport, and therefore there is, uh, if properly utilized, can be quite uh, a factor of drawing attention on a certain issue. i give you one example. There are conflicts that are, at the moment in particular, since there are so many, in particular so long, so protracted, Libya, Syria, Yemen, just to mention three, Afghanistan, 20 years almost, they will, uh, that uh, there is a donor fatigue and there is a psychological fatigue by everyone. 
So how do you wake up the people? How do you draw attention to it? Well, sport can be a messenger of that. And by doing so, producing donations for at least the humanitarian uh, relief in that conflict that uh, others would not be able to do. So the sport, like music, has a wonderful capacity of going across the borders and attracting people who normally would not be interested in politics. Absolutely. I think that's such a crucial point. I mean, it's emotional, it's passionate, it's, it brings people together on a level uh, that is so unifying. Um, and Mr. Felix, I wanted to just bring that point back to you as well, uh, in terms of, do you believe that there is enough donor support, that you get enough uh, you know, money, logistical support of being able to implement these amazing projects that you've been talking about? Well, the donor fatigue is um, uh, widespread, and it uh, you know it, it has to do. It doesn't only have to do with um, uh, conflicts or post-conflict uh, uh, societies, but it's uh, it's a wider issue that we need to to face. Uh, still, uh, what I uh, can what I can say uh, in that respect. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, uh, irrespective of uh, the uh, uh, money issue, which of course is, is crucial. Uh, and yes, we need to attract the attention and the interest uh, of uh, 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 grand donors uh, uh, whom are interested, which are interested in investing in, in sport and the power of sport, uh, which can certainly, as we have all uh, agreed, uh, uh, can certainly serve as a platform for peace, uh, not it does not bring peace, but it can serve as a platform for, for peace. But apart from that, I would also, uh, if I uh, may, Stephanie, like to uh, add a couple of points on synergies between big organizations uh, with, of course, a huge impact. Like, for instance, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee on the one hand, and the United Nations on the other. As you probably know, there is a milestone uh, in uh, 2009 when the IOC granted an observer status uh, uh, by the United uh, Nations, uh, recognizing actually uh, the former's importance in the use of sport as a tool in various activities across the globe in fields like humanitarian assistance, peace building, education, gender equality, and environment. Uh, also, uh, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, uh, since then contributes to the realization of 11 of the Sustainable Development Goals uh, established by the UN Agenda 2030, such as inclusive and quality education for all, gender equality, climate change, and of course, the promotion of peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development. And what's more, in 2015, uh, many people might, know, might not know that, uh, in a historic moment for sport and the Olympic movement, uh, sport was officially recognized as an important enabler of sustainable development and was included in the UN's Agenda uh, 2030. And as you may know, uh, in 2014, uh, the UN and the IOC signed an agreement uh, aimed at strengthening collaboration between them. And we also had IOC Honorary President, Zach Roge, uh, which was appointed as Special Envoy uh, of the Secretary General for Youth Refugees yeah. uh, and Sport. Uh, so, to make a long story short again, the UNIOC bond has proven to be strong, precious, and crucial for implementing various projects in a number of fields. And of course, you know, uh, 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 when we unite, uh, we are stronger and probably uh, we can uh, uh, easier, in an easier way, or at least this facilitates our work to seek uh, money uh, in order to uh, invest in infrastructure and invest in projects uh, that um, uh, help sport uh, uh, penetrate uh, society. Okay, um, I want to move on to challenges and things that perhaps you would like to see improve in an ideal world. Mr. Moratinas, let me start with you. Um, you're used to having to deal uh, with various uh, different sides, negotiations, discussing. What are the things that frustrate you more? What challenges do you believe that uh, you that are most important that you face, and what would you like to see improved when it comes to particularly the sports issues? Let's say. Well, I want also uh, sorry, but uh, the conversation is so lively that I think uh, when you listen to our friends, uh, ideas come to my mind, and I want to share with you. So, 
before responding to your last uh, question, let me add about uh, your question to Stefan de Mistura. Uh, there is uh, enough funding, there is enough uh, financing. I, I will agree with him, no. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't uh, have uh, all the means and resources to um, deploy in certain program and project. For instance, uh, we have with the ICAS a, a training handbook for the use of sport for the prevention of violent extremism through youth skill uh, development, voluntarism, and education. Well, that is a small attempt you not know, to address this issue. But if you go and you think, uh, uh, what is the situation today? You can immediately come to a conclusion. I think, uh, for instance, uh, football clubs, they are extremely wealthy. I mean, <laughs> the football, uh, let's say, uh, um, inverted commas enterprise is one of the wealthy in the world. <laughs> I mean, uh, and they are, of course, uh, very sensitive to be part of social responsibility. So that is what I'm trying to do with our partnership on this one humanity campaign with the Liga of Spain. I mean, they have a foundation, Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid, Liverpool, Manchester. So they have a lot of resources. Don't tell me they don't have resources because they are extremely wealthy. They are buying um, a pleasure for 200 million. Can you imagine what we can do with 200 million in order to convince? So uh, the question how we are going to channel this uh, fund in order that they are satisfied because of course they want to have uh, their own, uh, let's say, um, recognition of the work. At the same time, we can do things on the ground. So I will put uh, an example how important is not, uh, sometimes it's not so important about money, but how these uh, clubs can um, contribute to a better living. Um, an example that the president of uh, uh, Barcelona Football Club uh, shared with me. Uh, it was with uh, Bill Gates. Bill Gates was trying to put their vaccine uh, against malaria in many places in Africa. And unfortunately, they went to, let's say, inside uh, of certain African country and the people in the local communities uh, that were afraid about vaccine. So they didn't want to put vaccine. They say, what is this vaccine? Is something coming from the you know, the white uh, color civilization, they are trying to inoculate us with some, uh, so we don't know. So what was the idea? They asked uh, the Barcelona president to give uh, a t-shirt with uh, Messi and Barcelona. So when uh, the people of Bill Gates was trying to put vaccine, they give a t-shirt of Barcelona and everybody want to have the vaccine. So that means that everyone was vaccinated. Thank the, because they have this uh, attraction of the, so I think we have, and I think would be a good idea uh, as uh, Stefan had said and, and, and Constantino, maybe one day we have to have a specific uh, debate about how to finance a sport activities. I think it would be a good um, idea uh, how we can get everybody to have a collective responsibility to work on that. So answering your, what is the, the what is uh, concerning me? I mean, uh, concerning me as uh, all of us and, and mainly Stefani and myself that we've been in this very, very uh, frustrating work of mediation and trying to bring peace in this uh, region is that uh, we need a ceasefire. I mean, uh, ceasefire, mm, put the guns down and try to establish some uh, dialogue. And so uh, how a sport can contribute to that, I don't know exactly, but we have to find a way. But for me, uh, my concern is peace. It's not security, it's peace. And I think we've been too much uh, concerned about bringing security, bringing security, and it's a kind of insatiable security. You no know, much you demand security, more insecure are yourself. So you need uh, to create, you know, an environment of peace and that sport can create, you know, the condition for better understanding. But of course, uh, ceasefire 
put an end to the guns and to, let's say, uh, all these uh, clashes, military clashes, and then go to the table, round table of negotiation. Absolutely, I think uh, I think everyone would agree with you that how unifying sport is. Uh, yes, two pens, Mr. Phillies first, and then we'll move on to you, Mr. Dimistura. Very briefly, uh, this breeds from uh, Mr. Moratinos about a ceasefire, and since Olympic truce uh, is actually an attempt to have ceasefire uh, before, during, and after the Olympic and Paralympic Games. So I just wanted to, 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 to stress that we can understand the vast importance a ceasefire can have in war zones, if only for a month, because it provides an opportunity for a number of actions, from the provision of humanitarian aid, through the opening of requisite corridors, to time for seeking compromise formula. The main reason behind Olympic truce is that through even a temporary ceasefire, we provide the time for the involved parties, not just to sit at the negotiating table, but also to see the benefits of non-conflict and to consider whether in the end it is worth their while to continue hostilities rather than live in peace. Not necessarily in harmony, but in peace. Uh, yes, and I think, uh, Mr. Dimistri, you have extensive experience in temporary ceasefires. Um, so please make your point, but also I wanted to ask you if there's any memory you have of a sport related memory when it comes to potentially any temporary ceasefire or you know, anything that's involved in any of these countries that you've uh, extensively spent so much time trying to negotiate and trying to heal, uh, let's say, as you had described earlier. Thank you. Well, first of all, I just want to support what Constantino and Miguel have been saying. Absolutely. Now, how do you actually, let's go back to my medical background perhaps, because it's my, my strength in trying to accept the unacceptable sometimes, is uh, uh, how do you actually use sport or other initiatives which have the same uh, ecumenical approach in order to produce a ceasefire? Well, because an event of sport taking place at the end of a conflict or at the beginning of a ceasefire produces hope. And that's what the doctor needs to produce in a patient even when the disease is not over. You are going to make it. We can make it together. And then that produces CBMs, confidence building measure. And that produces a certain trust. And that produces a constructive embarrassment in breaking the ceasefire. And that brings a longer ceasefire. Now, again, once you have a ceasefire, you're also contributing to break the alibi that there is no other solution but the conflict. There is no other alternative but the spiral of fighting. And if you break that one for a week, a month, an hour, you're already giving the feeling that that alibi doesn't hold. So I've been using it, yes. The problem is that those who like doing the war and continuing the conflict know the trick. And when I proposed a vaccination or a sportive event, which I did in Afghanistan, in Iraq, not in Syria, I immediately felt that they were just waiting for the end of it to then start again. So that's why I feel that in order to give it the best chance, you have to still have a beginning of a ceasefire. Otherwise, they will play on it. Remember that during a sporting event, there is a lot of people and that means also an opportunity for spoilers to actually destroy the ceasefire by having an, an attack there. So it's a touch and go. It's complicated for but sure. But doesn't mean we should not do it. We should continue doing it. Absolutely. I mean, I wanted to also ask you in terms of what sports means to people, like we're talking about, you know, the, the feeling of hope, the feeling of unity. Um, how would you describe uh, what sports means to people in general. For example, a country that's been affected by conflict, uh, embargoed, people, there's no jobs, no opportunities. When it comes to watching their team win, for example, like give me a sense of how important sport is in the, at the grassroots level. I mean, I know going to refugee camps all over the world, I've always, there's always t-shirts, Barcelona, Qatar Airways, all these kids are always wearing sport, uh, football t-shirts. I mean, this is a standard across whatever conflict, uh, refugee camp, abandoned, you know, challenges there are. 
are. This is something you will, it's a constant. So all three of you actually would be interesting to, to, to see how you would describe how you feel uh, sport is perceived by the people on the ground. Let's move away from the politicians and the complexities of those who have the guns. Uh, Mr. Felix, let's start with you. Oh, okay. Um, well, <laughs> very, very good question. Or actually, the way you pose it uh, uh, makes it uh, uh, even uh, uh, better and uh, uh, more difficult to to respond. To be to be frank, um, you, you you talk about uh, refugee camps, and um, I and our team have visited uh, numerous new refugee camps here in here in Greece. Uh, because, as you know, of course, uh, Greece is uh, uh, nowadays, nowadays, since 2015, one of um, uh, the uh, European uh, member states which uh, has become uh, the external borders of the European Union with regard to the refugee uh, slash migration issue. And let me, by the way, refer to the initiative which was a, 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 a more than positive surprise taken by uh, President Bach, Thomas Bach, the president of the International Olympic Committee in 2015, shortly before the 2016 Olympic and Paralympic Games in Rio uh, to uh, create, to develop a team for refugees which participated uh, in uh, the Rio uh, Olympic and Paralympic Games. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I want to praise uh, this initiative taken by by President Bach, because uh, in a time when some leaders and some states were uh, uh, erecting walls with regard to refugees and migrants, the Olympic family sent a very clear, crystal clear message to the world that we should be inclusive rather than exclusive with regard to that issue, which by some is considered as a challenge. But getting back to your question, and I will uh, uh, very uh, briefly uh, refer to the role of the athletes, because it was mentioned by uh, the co-panelists. I just wanted to, to underline here how important athletes as role models can really become in any initiative, in any project, uh, because they can penetrate the souls and the minds, particularly of the young generation, in a much better way than diplomats, politicians, uh, academics, uh, journalists, uh, etc. So one of the things that I would like to bring to your attention is that we should, and I'm going to close with that, we should try and educate the athletes, because it is one thing to be a very successful uh, athlete, a very successful Olympic champion, and it is something totally different to use this power for a positive outcome that will be through uh, uh, your participation in a given project. So by educating athletes, uh, we can have very, very positive results with regard to touching the souls and the hearts of the young generation. Mr. Moratinos? Well, I think I, I fully agree with Constantinos. I will uh, uh, develop uh, his last uh, part of his intervention. I think uh, sport have, from my point of view, two main elements of, uh, I think, vital contribution. Uh, number one, uh, is uh, the values and principle that sport uh, uh, always have. And I think uh, uh, the solidarity, fraternity, unity, uh, playing together, um, fair play, um, respect of the others. Um, well, I think that is um, in its essence uh, values that have to be uh, disseminating the school education program, but also through a sport. I think there is a catalog of values that in any sport, you know, uh, can be enhanced and can be shared by all the, the, the person and youth, or young people that uh, uh, play a sport. And number two, as uh, Constantinos was saying, is the, the reference. I mean, athletes, um, sportmen are icons. They, are, uh, they represent their ideal for this uh, Jew. They, they, they are desperate. So they look, uh, 
they want to be, uh, I don't know, basketball player or to play in the NBA or being in the champion league. Uh, so they are the, they represent the success. And the word you use, Stephanie, uh, hope for their future. They are in this miserable condition, economic, social uh, condition, and they want to really get out of that. So how they are going to get out of that? They look to the icon, to the you know the reference, and that are the football players. Eight at the same time. Peter, so I'm going to have to cut you off. We have two okay, minutes. Sorry. Left. So that's that's my that's I that. I support to Mr. Dimitri for the last two minutes. Um, but absolutely, I think what you're saying in terms of hope and in terms of the role that both of you are saying that the athletes, these icons play is, is so crucial. Mr. Dimitri, we have two or three minutes left. Thank you. Well, what I heard, I can just agree completely. So if I can add something, or basically add something, well, is that uh, having been in so many horrible wars, and having seen and looked at the eyes of the victims at length, and by the way, this has been the strength also they have given to us, their determination in spite of the horror to continue. And um, I feel that the sport, whenever it took place, gave them and give them the perception of not being anymore alone, to be part of a larger community, of everyone else playing that sport, of feeling, a feeling that they are in fact back connected and for a certain moment also not being any more forgotten simply as a problem don't call me you have a problem you are a problem love point the first victim in a conflict is truth and that is a horrible victim because you don't know where the truth is but in sport the truth is in front of your eyes and that is a feeling of reminding yourself that you can still believe that truth exists Bottom line, I think whenever we can, and I think that's the purpose of this uh, brainstorming, we should be having sport as an ally, not only in many fields, but in particular, when in fact humanity is in difficulty, and that is during conflicts. Absolutely, I think it's been, uh, I've really enjoyed it, a fascinating discussion with all of your expertise when it comes to the role of you know, what these athletes should be playing when it comes to using sports, perhaps in the beginning of a ceasefire at the end of a conflict, you know, to create the opportunities and hopes for the children, uh, whether it's in refugee camps or uh, I think I think a lot of food for thought there. And let's hope that uh, these ideas can be taken practically. I know you all work hard to achieve that and have the help the and the support uh, to be able to implement that on the ground. I want to thank you all for your time, Mr. Moratinos, Mr. Feliz, Mrs. Dimistura. I think uh, it's been a wonderful discussion. Thank you.